Welcome to Market Matters, our markets podcast on Making Sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In this episode of Market Matters, we'll hear from the market data and positioning intelligence teams within our data assets and alpha group. They'll be talking about key macro, micro, and political themes in the context of our high-frequency trading data and proprietary signals from J.P. Morgan's markets business. Hi, I'm Eloise Goulder, head of the Data Assets and Alpha Group here at JP Morgan. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Chris Andrew in our electronic trading business to delve into equity market structure dynamics. Chris is head of market structure in EMEA, and we've worked together quite a lot over the years discussing volumes and flows and the shifts in presence of various market participants, including the retail investor, passive strategies, and even intraday strategies. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the latest from Chris. It's obviously been a very volatile period in markets over the last couple of weeks, and we will come to the present. But I also want to use this discussion as an opportunity to step back and understand the longer term trends in market structure. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast today. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. So, can you start by setting the scene and describing how you've observed turnover and liquidity change at a high level over the last few years? So, we started looking more closely at the longer term trends in liquidity about 15 months ago. And that was really a response to a lot of clients complaining that it was just becoming more and more difficult to get trades done. And what we saw shocked us a little, but it really backed up what clients were saying to us. Now, the way we looked at this was to calculate the turnover ratios. So that's the turnover divided by the capitalization in the relevant universe. And we did that for the developed markets in each region. And we used that measure because it strips out the actual price performance of the assets, which is notably diverged. And it just shows how quickly those assets are changing hands. When we looked at liquidity in that way, we saw a stark difference between the performance of the regions. In the US, from 2016 to 2022, the rate at which assets were changing hands had increased by about 23%. In the Asia-Pacific region, it had also increased by about 7%. But in Europe, over the same time period, that measure had decreased by around 25%. Wow, that's a shocking stat that European turnover fell by a quarter over that seven-year period, whereas turnover increased by almost that magnitude in the US. So a really clear divergence there between both regions. So if you're talking 2016 to 2022, then was this largely a pre-pandemic trend or has it actually persisted post-COVID? And the reason I'm asking this is to reconcile your data here with some comments that Peng Cheng, our colleague in research who's spoken on this podcast several times, has made previously, where he stated that volumes have actually declined in the US post-pandemic. Well, yes, that's certainly true. US volumes have come off a lot since the highs of the pandemic. That still doesn't really put much of a dent in the long-term trend. Another way of saying this is even if you take into account the fact that US turnover has fallen a lot recently, when you compare it with 2013, it's still increased by 25%. And so what do you think the cause of this decline in European turnover versus rise in US turnover has been over those years? It's a tough question. I've been speaking to a lot of colleagues and clients recently to try to join the dots, and I don't think there's one answer. Just a lot of plausible contributory factors. So a lot of different issues, but no silver bullet. But I do think one of the proximate causes is the makeup of our listings in Europe. I think when you look at the makeup of the big European indices, there hasn't been a great deal of turnover in the names represented there. We're not seeing new or fast-growing companies coming in and pushing out some of the older, slower-growing companies. And with those older companies, when you're thinking about trading, I think there's less of the uncertainty about their valuation and therefore the difference of opinion about what they're worth that ultimately generates trading volumes. That's such an interesting perspective. So... I know you've adjusted for performance or market cap in your turnover calculations, but would you say the underperformance of European equities over the years is part of this driver behind the decline in turnover and vice versa for US markets? I mean, European markets have underperformed US markets by about 40%, I think, from early 2016 through to last year. 
And I've always thought the drivers of that European underperformance has been linked to macro factors, including lower GDP growth here in Europe and the rapid decline in bond yields from 2018 through to 2020, which may have disproportionately benefited the higher multiple, higher duration US markets over the lower multiple European markets. So, Chris, Europe's price underperformance and the decline in turnover, they're presumably linked in some ways, at least. See, this is why I love our conversations, Anyways, I've been coming at this from more of a structural angle. I think you're right. I think it does seem a little naive to discount the impact of performance, particularly when you think about how the whole ecosystem operates now. I guess that that outperformance we saw in the US involved a much greater contribution from some of the types of investor that have been less active in Europe. Firstly, we have the retail investor, and they became a real force in US equities through the pandemic and appear to remain pretty active, but they've arguably not grown to the same extent in Europe. And then there are the ETF and passive flows, which have grown over the last decade. But these track indices, so by definition, they'll become more exposed to larger outperforming regions. I think you're right. When those groups get active, it also creates a lot more opportunity for the mid and high frequency strategies that keep the market efficient and satisfy short term demands for liquidity. So I do think performance is part of it, but I also think there may be structural factors in the European capital markets that we might want to come back to. That's so interesting. So what you're describing sounds like a bit of a virtuous cycle in terms of liquidity in US markets, i.e. US markets have been outperforming, perhaps for economic or macro reasons. But as a result, passive funds such as trackers, which, as you say, by definition, end up following outperformance and momentum have ended up dominating in US markets. And retail investors wanted a piece of this outperformance and came on board. And then systematic market makers have also capitalised on all this liquidity and, of course, lower transaction costs. And the result has been a highly liquid and broadly outperforming equity market in the US. Whereas in Europe, haven't we seen the opposite in that we've seen relative underperformance and we've seen less passive flows coming in by definition and a lesser presence of the retail investor, I think, and then less systematic market makers and presumably higher transaction costs in Europe too. I'm sure this is overly simplistic, but is there some truth in here, Chris? Yes. And by the way, just to add to the more negative cycle that we've had in Europe, I think we've had some UK-specific factors as well, and these are more structural, I think. For instance, some long-standing changes to accounting standards required firms operating defined benefit pension schemes to identify those schemes as assets and liabilities on their balance sheet. And that, in turn, arguably created an incentive to reduce the volatility of those balance sheet entries by more closely matching the investment strategy to the pension liabilities. And achieving that has meant investing a lot more in bonds and less in equities. One of the final effects of all that is simply to reduce the amount of capital that domestic pension funds have been able to invest in UK companies. And this long-running shift towards liability-driven investment in the UK has received some attention recently, partly because it's been linked to the sell-off in UK bonds in October 2022, but also because I think there is some interest in why the UK stock market has diminished in relative terms over the last 20 years or so. And so, Chris, do you think these UK accounting standards changes have particularly been an issue for UK corporates and UK equity markets? Well, that's another good question. UK asset managers don't just invest in the UK. We think they have a greater bias towards investing in Europe too. So I think although the link is less direct, it's plausible as a contributory factor that if UK DB asset managers looking after pension funds both moved away from equities and became less used to investing in smaller, riskier companies, then that also had an adverse effect on their approach to investing in continental European markets. That's really interesting. And of course, we can't hide from the fact that we've also seen policy changes in Europe and the UK over the period that we're talking about, haven't we? I mean, there's been Brexit and MIFID. So Chris, do you think that these have also played a role in the decline in liquidity or turnover in Europe? I think they have. And the reason I say that is I don't think we can ignore scale and how Europe is perceived as a region in which to invest and raise capital. So on the negative side, I'm I'm not going to read too much into this. And correlation is not causation, of course. But when you look at the long-term turnover ratios going back to 2013, there is a noticeable point at which the negative trend in liquidity appears to set in. And that's around 2016 when the UK and EU began their process of separation. 
I think the way that you interpret this kind of goes back to this kind of debate you and I are having about whether the reduction in liquidity that we've seen is more of a long-term structural problem to do with the growth and regeneration of European companies, or more of a cyclical phenomenon associated with those companies just being unloved over the last five or six years. And if you think it's the former, then the reason that matters is that, at least prior to Brexit, you know, yes, you, you had to squint a bit, but you could somewhat treat Europe as a single capital market in which to issue and invest. And Although the damage may be more symbolic, I think Brexit may have made it more difficult for investors and issuers to see it that way. But Eloise, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. I'm naturally a bit more focused on the structural explanations for the decline. But I think you lean towards the cyclical a little more. And do you really think a change in the cycle might pull us out of this? Oh, that's a good question, Chris. Well, I'm not sure if I'm a subscriber to this argument, but you could make the case that we're moving to a period of higher inflation and higher interest rates where duration assets, so typically equities trading on higher near-term multiples, should get disproportionately penalised due to the higher discount rate, while value assets or lower multiple stocks could benefit on a relative basis. And if this is true, then Europe's indices, which are far lower multiple than US indices, could indeed disproportionately benefit. And of course, we did see Europe's Eurostox 50 outperform the US S&P 500 from September last year through to early March by about 20%. Albeit there were plenty of other factors as well driving this, such as lower gas prices in Europe and inflation beginning to fall in Europe and economic growth beginning to stabilise and improve as measured via PMIs, for example, in Europe. But I think what's tough with this Europe outperforming US argument is that several facets seem to have turned on their heads just over the last two weeks amid much greater market uncertainty. And of course, the decline in central bank rate hiking expectations and the fall in 10-year bond yields. And related to all of this, a rally in duration assets and US markets on a relative basis. So, This is definitely a space to watch, and I'm sure we'll cover it in more detail in our upcoming podcasts. But Chris, can we turn to the implications of this decline in turnover in Europe? One implication must be the relative rise in transaction costs in Europe, which is part of that vicious cycle, isn't it? Because it's then less of an attractive opportunity set for the higher frequency investor types. But what about other implications, Chris? Do you think the lack of liquidity has something to do with the desire for corporates to reconsider whether they list here in Europe, for example? I think you're right. Yes, it's clearly a problem for transaction costs. But in the long term, I think we come back to this structural problem with scale for both the UK and continental Europe. You've mentioned the issue of corporates' desire to list in Europe to the extent they have other obvious alternatives. And clearly, the recent decisions by ARM and CRH in the UK, and indeed Linda's decision to delist in Germany, have thrown a spotlight on that. And that raises the longer-term concern whether, if we do manage to nurture fast-growing companies in Europe, will they list here or elsewhere? So, Chris, it's all looking a bit gloomy for European corporates, isn't it? But can I just ask about the European retail investor? We know the retail investor has been a dominant or growing force in US markets, which, as you said earlier, has helped in this US virtuous cycle of liquidity. But is the retail investor also growing in Europe? Do you have any sense of how they are behaving over here? Well, yes, some. Although I would stress that we're really just beginning to dip our toes in the water on European retail. But we did put out a very short note to clients on this a few weeks ago. So the challenge with Europe is that there's a lot of different ways that retail flow gets executed, and it tends to differ country by country. There's also no particular requirement to report or identify retail flow. So it's like piecing together a big jigsaw puzzle. What we put out in our note, though, was just the result of looking at market data that we could associate with a few significant trading mechanisms that are linked specifically to retail activity in Europe. And what that showed, at least in the places that we looked, was that retail flow did tend to see sharp increases in market share with the onset of the pandemic. And in most cases, that was somewhat sustained throughout the lockdown years and going into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But then it largely died out after that. The one exception seems to be in the FTSE for 250 in the UK, which seems to have kept going at about double the retail market share that we saw in the years prior to the pandemic. But 
just away from those sort of temporary dynamics, I do think there is a sort of a chicken and egg situation with retail investors. And I think your team's research shows this. Retail investors like to invest in companies that capture their imagination. And I think the German retail market tells a story here. Germany, for instance, is it's actually a big retail market. And if you look at the range of shares listed on Deutsche Börse, you'll notice there's a huge array of international listings like Apple or Tesla. And they're not there for institutional investors. They're there to satisfy a retail appetite to trade those shares through domestic infrastructures. So I guess my point is that if the listing environment across Europe were a bit more dynamic, I think there would be plenty of interest from retail investors. Of course, demonstrable interest from retail investors would also potentially encourage more listings in Europe in a kind of virtuous circle. And the same goes for institutional investors, of course. So you've touched on some of the drivers for retail investors to participate in equities there, Chris. But coming back to comments from our research colleague, Peng Cheng, he has previously argued that there are other factors driving retail activity in the US, seen particularly through the pandemic. And those include higher volatility in markets, the ability to trade with zero commissions, social media activity and access to content and insights, and then, of course, the lure of past outperformance. So, Chris, which of these additional factors would you say are mirrored here in Europe? On the whole, in Europe, these are secondary factors compared to that issue of capturing the imagination. In other words, if you solve that problem, these become much more relevant, but I don't think they're so relevant at the moment. That said, I think there are some signs of evolution here in Europe. My point about Germany... There are exchanges there offering fee-free trading, and that's targeted to retail investors. At the same time, it's worth noting that there are in-flight regulatory proposals in Europe which aim to limit the practice of payment for order flow, which is usually more associated with the retail business. That said, we don't know the shape of the final rules, and the impact of firms' ability to offer commission-free trading under those rules isn't clear to me yet. So Chris, coming back then to the decline in turnover in Europe... Would you argue that if European equity performance could pick up sustainably, then volumes could pick up in tandem and we may manage to get out of this somewhat vicious cycle? I think that's possible. Passive flows could come in, retail investors could get more interested, lured by better performance and some of the factors we just discussed. And then you might begin to kickstart this virtuous cycle where volumes increase, transaction costs fall and more players want to engage. And you also mentioned possible changes on the policy front. So are there any positives we can look towards there? Yes. Well, I mentioned earlier that we may have lost some of the scale benefits of the European almost single capital market. Now, I think that point about losing scale has never been lost on the European Commission, which is why there are plenty of long-running initiatives to create a more formal capital markets union for Europe. So by way of example, if we think of positive steps that can help continental Europe to achieve scale, I think the idea to create a proper consolidated tape for Europe is a really good case in point. It's partly about easing the practicality of getting the market data for the exchanges of 28 different countries into one place. But it also has huge symbolic value because it showcases the potential scale of Europe. And just going back to retail for a moment, by the way, I think that really has a potential role in stimulating cross-border retail demand, which tends to be very domestic otherwise. Also, I think in the UK, some of the proposed policy responses to improving our capital markets function have been more noticeable, if only because they've been able to put forward proposals more quickly without having to reach agreement with the EU. So, for example, recent proposals under the Edinburgh reforms to create a more formal market for privately held shares are an example of a policy designed to boost investment in the smaller companies of today that we hope become the big companies of tomorrow. But scale is going to remain a challenge. It's absolutely right that we encourage the growth of new companies. But Europe needs scale to keep them here as well, to our earlier discussion about ARM and CRH. So it sounds like there are some positives we can look towards then on the regulatory side. Yes, I hope so. Having said that, the recent volatility accepted, I don't see any real evidence of an improvement in European turnover data so far, in spite of the European market outperformance from September to February. But it's early in the year and I think we need to see a few months more data before we can be certain of any change. But I guess if Europe does start to outperform more and we really don't see that reflected in the turnover statistics, then I think it strengthens the argument that the problems are more structural rather than cyclical. Well, let's follow up on that point in due course then, Chris. And we shouldn't forget that performance and turnover or liquidity must be interconnected themselves, don't you think? I completely agree. You know, I made that point earlier about the proximate cause being the makeup of European listings. 
Clearly, I've come at that from a turnover perspective, but I think the nature of those listings is also implicated in the performance, particularly in recent years. Absolutely. Well, Chris, earlier on, you mentioned recent market volatility, and there's obviously been some significant market moves going on in recent weeks. So what about current market dynamics? Have volumes picked up across the board? Yes, volumes have certainly picked up recently. Going into the tail end of last week, we were seeing about a doubling of trading volumes and spreads up by about 25% versus early March. Looking at the news this morning, there doesn't seem to be any immediate sign of that volatility going away, but I'm not going to try and guess how long that's going to go on for. Of course. Well, I always try and end these conversations with the question of what's next on your plate. So Chris, what are you looking at next and what are clients asking you for? I think there's more work we can do on the European retail sector. So we're hoping to produce something more comprehensive than the short note we already sent out. And I think that question about where does European liquidity go from here isn't really going to go away either. You know, it's that change in macroeconomic environment that you talked about going to feed through at some point. Will the UK or European reforms have an impact or will Europe continue to lose out to US capital markets? I totally agree, Chris. I think that US versus European outperformance debate rages on, particularly given the events of the last couple of weeks in which we've seen this pretty sharp underperformance in Europe once again. So we've covered a huge amount today from the rise in turnover in the US to the decline in turnover in Europe to the drivers of this, including in the States, the rise in participation from retail investors and passive strategies and systematic market making strategies, all helping drive that somewhat virtuous cycle for liquidity. And then we've discussed the impact or the implications of these changes in turnover, with transaction costs in the US having fallen relative to those in Europe and a possible impact on where companies therefore choose to list. And finally, we've discussed some possible policy changes and responses that we may be able to look towards in attempt to improve capital markets functioning here in Europe. So Chris, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak today. Thank you, Eloise. It's been a pleasure. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning in to this bi-weekly podcast from our group. If you'd like to access the European Retail Investor Note that Chris referred to earlier, which he published a few weeks ago, then do get in touch with one of us. Or if you've got feedback or questions, or if you'd like to explore our wider team content further, then please do go to our website at jpmorgan.com forward slash market dash data dash intelligence And there you can send us a message via the contact us form. And with that, we'll close. Thank you. If you're enjoying this conversation, you can subscribe as well as our other podcasts to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Follow JP Morgan's Making Sense on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. The views expressed in this podcast may not necessarily reflect the views of J.P. Morgan Chase & Co. and its affiliates. Together, J.P. Morgan. They are not the product of J.P. Morgan's research department and do not constitute a recommendation, advice, or an offer or a solicitation to buy or sell any security or financial instrument. This podcast is intended for institutional and professional investors only and is not intended for retail investor use. It is provided for information purposes only. Reference products and services in this podcast may not be suitable for you and may not be available in all jurisdictions. J.P. Morgan may make markets and trade as principal in securities and other asset classes and financial products that may have been discussed. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, please visit www.jpmorgan.com forward slash disclosures forward slash sales and trading disclaimer.